So welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Samantha Bruno. I am the Interim Assistant Director of Graduate Career Services here at, Mar at Mark's Career Services. Um, I'm joined here with Suzanne Grossman, the Deputy Director of Alumni Relations and Career Services. Thank you all for joining us for a talk with Carmen Mazzara on Careers in International Affairs. She joins us from ASPIA, the, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. So from here, um, now I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you, Carmen. Feel free to share your screen and tell us everything you know. I can't promise that, but thank you so much to, to Sam and to Suzanne for inviting me. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. As was said, my name is Carmen Mazzara and I'm with the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. I have a brief presentation that's going to walk through some of the many, many, many possibilities within international affairs careers, but I definitely want to make sure that you all get out of this session what would be beneficial. So if there's something you absolutely don't want to leave without us talking through, please feel free to put it in the chat, and I will do my best to tackle those issues, and we'll try to, to deliver as much as we can. I'll also make sure that the career office has my slides. So if I go past something and you say, wait, come back, I wanted to see that. That's totally fine. They will have a copy. Their recording will be there. So there's lots of different ways you can follow up. And I'll also be able to put some information in the chat later, but even more tools and resources that you can, can use to continue this particular exploration. So with that, I want to jump right into the slides themselves. Can folks see this? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, excellent. All right, can folks see this? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Excellent. Last time I did this, uh, the slides didn't advance. And so you were deprived of all these beautiful visuals that I'm about to share with you. So when we talk about the fields of international affairs, part of the reason that I joke that it's so hard to share everything is because the field is so big. Lots of folks know well the pretty traditional classic paths like development or defense or diplomacy, but there is an international affairs career aspect to almost everything. Energy, the environment, science, technology, business, trade, education, law, all of these have an international affairs element to them. And that's why the field is what we call an interdisciplinary field. It brings together all of those pieces, politics, business, history, law, language, all economics, all of that lives in the international affairs space. And because the field is so big, it may be hard to know whether this is a great place and a great space for you. So maybe you feel called into the field because you wanna tackle some of the big problems of our day. Poverty, climate change, disease. I think disease is one that most people feel very personally in these, in these times that we live in. So maybe that's where you wanna put your professional energy. Maybe you wanna use your professional life not what you do on your, on your own time or what you do as a volunteer, but your professional life and energy to be of service and to help people. And that's how you wanna spend that, those working years that you have. Maybe you're curious about the world and you love different languages and people and places and food and all of the richness that comes in the world has to offer. Maybe you have seen very directly, and I think that's also something that's been driven home to folks, how policy choices, impact our everyday lives and you want to be a part of that decision making and that policy process and that's the space that you want to use your professional life for. Maybe you're like me and you just like to argue, right? You love that back and forth and that exchange and convincing someone that you're totally right and occasionally being convinced that someone else has a good point and it's that that exchange of information that really is what something you want to be have as part of your professional career. And maybe if it's not any of these things, you just know deep in your heart that you want to use your professional life to be part of positive change, to play some role in making the world better than you found it. And whether it's any of these or something else, there is a place and there is a space for you in the fields of international affairs. So what kinds of things can come together? And this is one of those slides that I promise I'm not going to read to you, but you can revisit later when you have a chance to take a look at my slides. But there's so many different very powerful combinations that can be put together to build a really interesting and a fulfilling career in the fields. Maybe you're interested in history or a particular part of the world and you combine that with a focus on business and you become an analyst who looks at the risks for different businesses in different places, but you have to draw on all of that historical and that regional knowledge that you have. 
Maybe you love to write and you put that together with an emphasis on a particular part of the world or a particular issue and you can go and be a human rights monitor and you use those writing skills that you have to really accurately portray what's going on in a particular place to recount those stories and to hold people accountable for what happens there. Maybe it's education and you wanna go work with refugees, whether it's in refugee camps or as they come into different communities and help them be car become part of different places and different systems. Whether it's, again, any of these or some other combination, there's so many different angles and ways to get at an international affairs career. So how can you compete? Well, we generally, because the field is so big, talk about it in four big buckets. We talk about careers in the public sector, local, national, statewide governments. We talk about careers in the private sector, for-profit companies. We talk about careers in the nonprofit sector, and that's maybe think tanks, it might be universities, there's lots of opportunities within that nonprofit space. And then again, broadly painting, we talk about the space in the multilateral agencies, the UN, the World Bank, and all of that different family of institutions that bring together different governments, intergovernmental organizations. No matter which of those four you might wanna start in, and lots of people move quite fluidly between the four of them, there's five key skill sets that I think everybody needs if they wanna build on that international career. The first one is some kind of professional experience, understanding what it is to be in a workspace, to have a boss, to have coworkers, to have teammates, to have people who report to you. In a perfect world, which I understand we don't live in, that kind of experience would happen in an international setting. Understanding what all of those dynamics mean when you are dealing with people from other cultures, other places, other languages. All of those kinds of components are going to prepare you for any of those kinds of sectors and understanding how it is to be a professional in the space. And we'll talk about some of the ways you can get those experiences in a, in a little bit. I think everybody needs to learn how to write well and speak clearly. You can know everything there is to know about a subject, but if you can't get it out clearly and concisely in written form, all that knowledge in your head doesn't do you any good. And I'm not talking about those 80 page papers that your professors ask you to write. I'm talking about all of the knowledge that's in that 80 page paper in a page and a half. You need to take all that you know on a subject and give that information to me, but I don't have time to read an 80 page paper. So I need it short and tight and clear. So that is a great skill for you to practice while you're still a student because all of that information transfer is exactly what you're gonna be doing no matter what role you have in all of those different sectors. The same thing is true about being able to speak comfortably in front of lots of different kinds of audiences. If you are talking to high school students, if you are talking to heads of state and government or anybody in between, you need to, again, be able to transmit all that you know about a particular subject and convey it in a way that those different audiences are going to be able to understand. And again, in that perfect world, it's gonna also be in a language aside from your native language. Being able to do all of that, convey all of that outside of your native language is really one of those skill sets that helps to set people apart. Another language of sorts that a lot of people need to understand is the analytical piece, the information piece. For some of you, that might be the data, the quantitative mathematics of calculating information. But for others, it might just be understanding what that information tells you, whether it's doing the math or not. What's working about this particular situation? What doesn't work? How do I keep and grow the things that do work? How do I fix the things that are broken? And all of that analytical understanding and the ability to unpack a situation is a critical component because again, no matter what sector you are in, you're going to have to be working with others, delivering on projects, delivering on programs, delivering on whatever the promise of that organization is. So you're going to need to be able to discern what's working and what isn't. So really being able to, to have that analytical skill set is really, really useful, whether it's on the technical mathematical side or not. Related to that is this idea of, uh, here it talks about project management, but what that really means is can you have an idea in your head and can you make it a reality? Can you marshal the human resources, the financial resources, all of those different pieces to move something from point A to point C? And that also is a critical skill set because all of us are going to have to deliver something. It could be a webinar like this, it could be a multi-billion dollar project. 
whatever it is, being able to own and move something along the chain and make it a reality is really, really critical. And then the other piece is having a network of people around you. And I'm sure the career office is always on your case about networking and, and all of those kinds of pieces. That's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm also talking about having a pool of people that you can go to to get information, even outside of those networking relationships. Your classmates, your faculty, the staff, the alumni from the program, all of those different people count as part of your network and can inform you in the decisions that you make about all sorts of different pieces and open doors for you as you move forward. So I talked about how everybody needs these things, but where can you get them? Obviously on the professional experience side, it's about internships. It's about work study opportunities you might have. Anything that gets you into that professional setting and exposes you to how these different offices and components work. For writing and speaking and language proficiency, things like study abroad, for those of you who are earlier in your academic career, fellowships, for those of you who are a little bit later, all of these can be great ways to get out to practice your writing skills as you put that application together, to gain that language skill. All of those are really, really critical pieces. On the analytics side, I'm pleased to say it's probably something you have to do anyway. You can use the coursework that you have not only to practice your writing and your public speaking skills, and school is a great place to do that because it's a safe space. People want to support you and they want to watch you practice those skills, but it also can help you sharpen your analytics. Can you use the coursework you have to do anyway to practice those muscles of unpacking a situation, finding what works, finding what needs to be repaired? All of those different pieces can be something you do in the course of the stuff you have to turn in for class anyway. On something like project management, lots of different opportunities and, and ways to practice that skill. Things like Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, volunteer opportunities. It could be something remote like the UN Volunteer Corps, the humanitarian street map project, any of those kinds of pieces are gonna let you sharpen that ability to own a project and move it forward. But also let you sharpen your writing skills and your analytic skills. So there's lots of things that you can build with different particular opportunities. And then on the network side, I talked a little bit about those folks who are immediately around you, but there's a million young professionals groups events you can attend, all of these different pieces to build out that, those, those relationships that you have and the people who can help and support you. Now, I'm not naive. I understand that we are in the middle of a really distinct moment in global time. So I also wanna talk about how you can gain some of those skills even in the middle of a global pandemic. So those internships and those volunteer opportunities and those work study opportunities, many more of them are remote now than at any time in the past. So opportunities that had previously been confined to students who were in DC or Geneva or Tokyo are now available to everyone and anyone wherever they happen to be. So there's lots of ways to gain that experience and that exposure that, that weren't possible before the pandemic. There's also a lot of stuff going on right now in your community that you can access even without traveling, even without going anywhere. In the greater New York area, there are a ton of international opportunities that are going on. It could be something that you may not even think of, like if you're interested in combating human trafficking, you know who has a huge department on combating human trafficking? The NYPD. They also have a huge component working on cyber crimes, on funneling money, on money laundering, on, on counterterrorism. They have a huge department in counterterrorism at the NYPD. So again, on a hyper-local level, there's a chance to build these relationships. Maybe it's on international trade and you don't necessarily wanna go work for a big international trade firm, but the city, the, your local department of economic development is gonna be helping entrepreneurs get export ready. There's a huge movement working on public diplomacy. All of these things are happening right now in your community where you are. And they may not have to be down at the UN. It can be really hyper-local and build those global connections. I talked a little bit about using your coursework to practice your writing and your analytical and your public speaking skills. But even outside of that, maybe there's a faculty member who's working on issues that you really care about and you can team up with them to help support their research and use all of those skills and practice those skills one-on-one -on -one with them in a really, again, local way that you can access even during the pandemic. And even outside of that, you can take the writings that you've done and put them forward for blogs and journals and publications. There are a ton of ways to showcase your writing and your analytical skills and have someone else come in and say, yeah, 
that piece that Lucia wrote was really good. That's why we put it in our journal. That's why we put it up on our blog. That's why we put it out on this particular piece. And if folks are curious about that, I'm, I'm happy to list some of the things that I know about, but there's a million more out there that I may not even be aware of. I talked a little bit about some of the remote volunteering opportunities like the UN Volunteer Corps and Humanitarian Street Map, but there's also ways if, if free work is not necessarily something that's in your, in your po possibility right now, maybe there's the possibility of picking up something like a freelance project that's a one-off singular item, deliver this by this date. Maybe it's a contract work where instead of one specific project, you're, you're with an organization for a particular period of time. And there's lots of ways to find those, those opportunities. They're usually paid. So even if you're working outside of school and you have school, but you need that other particular professional development component, you can pick up some of these, these smaller pieces that you can get your hands around and practice all of these skills and get some income from it. And even during the pandemic, and especially during the pandemic, you have a lot of different ways that you can build up that network and those relationships. I talked about some of those young professionals groups all of them or almost all of them are meeting online, they're meeting virtually, they're hosting virtual events. Some of them are really big and broad like young professionals in foreign policy. Some of them are hyper, hyper specific like women of color advancing peace and security. So whether you have a particular issue area that you care about like peace and security or all of foreign policy and international affairs, there are these different ways virtually to tap in and connect. I would also encourage you to go to the events that are run by all of these different organizations. They've all moved online during the pandemic. So again, in a way that before COVID, you had to be in DC or Tokyo or Geneva or wherever to participate, to hear what the speakers had to say, to learn how they talk about issues, to understand all the terms to art and who the characters are. Now you can do that in your jammies, from your house, from your dorm room, from your apartment, wherever you are, and come to understand how this particular space talks about itself, what the things they're thinking about are, and then you can go to that speaker and say, oh, so-and-so, I saw you talk at the uh, Geneva Center for Security panel on X and Y. I really loved your point about this, had a few questions about that. And it gives you an opening, a way to, to start to build a relationship with them and do that networking in a way, again, that would never have been possible if you had to physically be in Geneva in person. So there's lots of different possibilities to build these skills that are going to serve you well, no matter what of those, which of those sectors you find yourself in at any given moment. So once you've kind of got that sense, and if folks would find it helpful, I'm, I'm happy to talk through how you can discern between all of those different possibilities and some ways to figure out what kinds of questions or, or avenue you want to start in, because everybody has to start somewhere. But once you have that general sense, then comes the time to put together that quality application that's gonna showcase all of those skills that I talked about. Every, every organization is gonna be different. So on behalf of your poor beleaguered career staff, just read directions and follow directions. But broadly speaking, the kinds of things that many organizations are gonna ask for are the ones that you see on the screen. A cover letter, and we'll talk about those in a minute. A resume or a CV, they are different things. So be sure you understand which one they've asked for. Some places are going to want transcripts from every institution you've attended. So maybe you studied abroad and directly enrolled in a school. Maybe you did a different degree, a community college, a different program beforehand. You might need those transcripts. And COVID has complicated the delivery times on some of those pieces. So it's really important if that is something that you might need to turn in to, to plan ahead to make sure you have enough lead time to have those resources. And a lot of employers will also accept unofficial transcripts. So if it is something from the past, you can do that request a little bit earlier and it doesn't have to be officially sent and signed and sealed from the institution. A lot of places are gonna want a writing sample and folks get tripped up often with writing samples. So something I usually recommend is if you have a paper that you've already written that you're really proud of, thinking about two or three pages that could kind of live on their own within that paper. And maybe it needs a little massaging at the beginning and a little massaging at the end, but something that you can extract from work you've already done to stand out as a great example of how clearly, concisely, correctly you write. You would be amazed at how many of the people you're competing against cannot handle noun, verb, predicate. Makes my life real easy because I just delete those folks straight away. But if you would like to not be deleted straight away, 
thinking about that kind of writing that's gonna showcase what you can do. If you don't have a piece like that, thinking about maybe adapting something you do have or finding an outlet that will let you create something so you can again, hit both on the professional development side and creating an application piece together. But having a good writing sample or two in your pocket is a really critical thing because you don't know when an organization is gonna ask for it. For example, we ask for it for our remote internship because a lot of what that intern does is putting out public writing, public content. And I need to believe that someone can actually do that in a way that reflects the way I want our organization to sound. You're also gonna need references. And I'll talk about those a little bit in a minute too, but for those who are earlier in your time at school, thinking about as you go through school, who you wanna stay in contact with, who you want to maintain and keep that relationship with. And for folks who are a little closer to graduation, thinking about who you've had in the past that you want to continue to nurture that relationship with. Because what you don't want to happen is five years after you graduate, you need that reference and you call back and you go, oh, uh, Professor Bruno, do you remember me? I sat in the back, I didn't say anything, I never talked to you, can you write me a letter of recommendation? And the best, if she was feeling really generous that day, she could possibly do is say, Suzanne was nice, she came to class. Well, that doesn't help you, that doesn't help me as an employer understand why I should hire you. So thinking about those relationships, thinking about who you want to build them with, thinking about who you want to maintain them with, that's a critical component and it changes where you are, depending on where you are in your academic cycle. And again, I'm happy to talk about strategies to do that too, um, if that would be useful. So let's talk about cover letters. Um, cover letters are a beast and we all know that they are, but the objective of the cover letter is not to get you the job. The objective of the cover letter is not to tell me your entire life story. The objective of the cover letter is to help me get interested enough in you and understand enough about what you do that makes me want to interview you. So it has to live symbiotically with your resume and it has to live connected to the job description to make it very clear and obvious why I should want to talk more to you. So I usually recommend a five paragraph model for a cover letter. And some people even wouldn't even go that far. First paragraph, okay, that can be about you short and tight, I'm applying for this position as seen on LinkedIn, and then something really quick that encapsulates all of what you can offer me and why I should keep reading. Because as an employer, I am looking for reasons to delete applications. I will always have more applications than jobs most of the time. So help me understand right up front why I should bother with you. The middle couple paragraphs, that's about me as the employer and what you can do for me. I asked for this in the job description, here is how you have it. Here, I, I want this kind of person or this kind of skill set. here's where it is. Close or concise, connected, and clearly linking those two things for me. And again, I, and I'm, not everybody takes this approach, but I do, I don't care about your passion. I don't care about what you want. I am looking for what I want. So thinking as you write this cover letter about how you are going to help me be better at whatever my organization seeks to do. World peace, making widgets, doesn't matter. The point of the cover letter is to showcase why I should be interested in you because you are gonna make me better at what I can do. And then you close out with what we could do together. I'm very excited that my skills are gonna help you make more widgets and, and put them out into the world, whatever it is. But that tight five-part structure is, again, going to make it really clear and easy for me to see why I should want to learn more about you. And the resume is the same. Like I said, they live together with the cover letter, partially because you never know what somebody's going to read first. I read resumes first. I'm not going to bother with sentences if your resume is terrible. I have friends who read cover letters first, because if you can't handle noun, verb, predicate, they don't really care what you've done in the past. So you don't know which of us you're gonna get. So again, they have to live together. But a resume, again, it's tight, it's clear, it's connected to that job description. And you, can, you know what I'm looking for based on what is in that job description. I think it goes without saying that both the resume and the cover letter should be free of typos, although you'll be amazed at how often that happens too. I, again, as the old curmudgeon person that I am, will argue that 
for most of you this early in your career, one page. And I will die on this hill, one page for early career professionals. I don't need to know what you did in the fourth grade unless you're applying to like the Association of Fourth Grade Science Fair Professionals. I don't care. If you are not a freshman in college, I don't totally care what you've done in high school unless it's related to the job. So, and I even see graduate students who have what they did in high school. I don't care. That is, that is a different life. Tell me about what you're up to now. So again, this is why I, I am firm on the one page rule, but, but there are lots of people who disagree with me. And when they present, you can hear their rant about why their approach is better than mine. But the other key thing for a resume is really about giving me details, giving me information. It doesn't necessarily have to be statistics or numbers, but give me the who, give me the what, give me what the results were. If you work in a coffee shop and you serve 57 customers an hour, um, you know, between Monday through Friday, it's 12 hours a day, those are details. That's the who, that's the what, that's the why. If you handle $10,000 a day in sales receipts at that coffee shop, that's a detail. That's something I can understand. It shows me that you can be trusted with very important things like large sums of money, that you have customer service skills because you've been processing all of these people in that short period of time. It gives me something to measure you and your experiences by and how they relate to what I want. So all of those details, all of those numbers can be really critically important as I'm trying to gauge who I wanna learn more about. If you are lucky enough to get the interview, do your homework, learn about the company, know that job description, think about what kinds of questions you might get asked that are gonna link what they've clearly told you they want to what you've done. If you can find out who the interviewer is, learn about them. Practice, there's a million different blog posts and websites and articles and all of those pieces. And if you don't have them, I'm sure your career office does, you know, the 57 most common interview questions. Doing a quick look at those kinds of things and starting to think, well, how would I answer that? Some of the questions that trip people up the most are very simple things like, why do you want this job? If you can't tell me on a basic level why you want this job, then, then that is a red flag to me that maybe you don't want this job. So really prepping and thinking in advance, and it doesn't have to be anything formal. It can be you know, in the shower, whatever it is. How would I answer a question like that? So there's lots of different ways to, to gear up for that interview, even if you don't have the time or the ability to do the really formal interview prep. A key tool in this component can be something like LinkedIn. And for folks who are not yet on LinkedIn, I would encourage you to check it out as you're able. It helps you understand a little bit more about the interviewer. It helps you understand a little bit more about the company or the job. The about us section on that company's or that organization's website can also be a really critical thing to help you get some of that really good market intel if you are lucky enough to get the interview. I talked briefly about letters of rec, so I won't go too deep into that here, but my only other piece that I would say to you is don't ask, don't ask your grandma. I'm sure she thinks you're lovely. That doesn't help me in a letter of rec. Don't ask the most famous person you can find unless they can actually speak to who you are and what you've done. As an employer, what I am trying to understand from a letter of recommendation is, is more about you than you are gonna tell me yourself. Someone who's worked with you, someone who's seen what kinds of results you can deliver, whether it's in the classroom, in your faith community, in a job, where, whatever it is, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm trying to understand. So it's okay to give your recommenders some ammunition. If you're applying for a job and the job really has a lot of data and quantitative pieces to it, you can say, oh, would you please talk about this data project that I did? Or would you please talk about you know, the work I did in your stats class or the details that I was able to command when I was that barista? Whatever it is, give them some things that they can remind them so they know what to say to that employer when that, that time for the letter of recommendation comes. So I'm about to wrap up, but I did wanna share with you all some of the many other different tools and resources that we have at APSIA. When we can have public facing events, we love to do that. We're having a conversation later today uh, with an alum from an APSIA program who's currently the vice president of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, if anybody's interested in that. But all sorts of public events, ways for, for students to build relationships with our graduate schools, all kinds of different, different pieces along those lines. If you're looking to get some of that experience, we have a filterable directory of fellowships and scholarships. 
So whether it's language skills, study abroad, research, professional development, grad school, all of those kinds of things, you can filter that way. For folks who are thinking about graduate school or mid-career programs, all of our schools have profiles on our website. We have an in-depth career guide online that goes a little bit more into each of those sectors I talked about in the beginning, gives some tips, suggests some different organizations. And then we have a really active jobs board that has a ton of different opportunities, both remote and in person. And we're as active as we can be on social media, trying to put out internships and stories and fellowships and jobs and all kinds of different pieces to hopefully make it a little easier for folks to come into the space. So with that, I am gonna stop talking um, and it looks like we'll open it up for Q&A now. Um, I don't know if you have any, Samantha, or I can just keep prattling on, you tell me. Yeah, no, absolutely. So thank you so much, Carmen, um, for all that information, for all that insight. Um, yeah, so we, at this time, we'll open it up for questions. Um, if anyone, you know, feel free to raise your hand, unmute, or just put it in the chat. Um, I'll actually kick this off with, with um, the first question. Um, so majority of our participants here were already in the Masters of International Affairs and the MPA, MIA and MPA programs and the higher education programs here at Marks. Um, I guess a question that I have is what is ideally or what are like ideally job titles or the, the steps of a career, let's say post grad school and then also post doctor. We do have a couple students who are interested in probably going for a doctorate. Sure, so I wish there was some standard manual that, you, that one could assess. Um, painting with a really broad brush um, in each of those sectors. So on the government level, depending on how much other experience you have, the, the um, OPM, the Op Office of Personnel Management puts out explanations of what each of the steps on the GS scale means. So you can go to, the, to their primer and say, oh yes, I have a master's, but I also have three to five years experience or I have a master's and I have zero years experience and you're gonna be in really different places. So it's not just the degree. So going to the, finding the GS scale and I, if I stop talking at some point, I can find the link. Um, on the public sector side, that's gonna be a good way to understand what level you fall at because it's your degree plus your years of experience, plus if you're a veteran, plus if you're this, plus if you're that. On the private sector side, typically a master's degree is gonna bring you in somewhere in the analyst, manager, associate, and again, it varies widely. In some cases, an associate is like, you know, 12 years old and 15 minutes of experience. In other cases, it is that PhD, but, but associate's usually a good one, analyst, manager, something in that range, rather than something that's more coordinator, assistant, those are often more of the BA and, and a little bit kinds of levels. And again, I'm painting with a really broad brush and there's no clear cut way to like, I, I, nobody's standardized this. Every organization is different. On the nonprofit side, it's gonna be similar. An associate on the nonprofit side is usually more entry level, but a manager might be a little bit farther along. Some even all the way up to the assistant director level, again, depending on the size of the organization. Um, you know, again, analyst or analytics, something, something, something that conveys that there's a slightly deeper skill set there than a, than a broad general undergraduate degree might be required. And then on the multilateral level, you know, the UN is like a master's plus five just for an entry level P2 kind of thing. They also have a scale P2, P3, P4 that they explain on the careers.un.org site. So you can also go there and see how you relate to their scale. Um, but again, it's going to be consultant, maybe a manager. Assistant director is going to be more of those PhD students who are there. Um, for the PhD students, it might also be on the nonprofit side, something like a fellow, maybe an assistant director. Um, on the for-profit side, maybe something like researcher, on the, for a PhD, some of them might also be analyst. It, it would depend if you're looking for a big um, think tank analytics company like a RAND, that's gonna be a PhD and that's gonna come in at the researcher analyst kind of level. Whereas for others, it's gonna be um, an analyst at uh, like a risk analyst at Netflix is like a master's in a bit. So which actually who hire a lot of international affairs grads. So, you know, it's, it, I wish I could just kind of cut it across, but you know, 
generally avoiding the coordinator things, you're probably a little higher than that. Avoiding some of the assistant, you know, an associate you should read carefully. Those are those are some of the keys. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate like hearing like, you know, it kind of just speaks to the whole like um, one uh, job titles are are so um, versatile versatile across different types of organizations and employers. Like even when you're in the same field, um, actually, just a follow up question on that. Could you go into a little bit more about what consulting looks like in international affairs? If, if anything, whatever. You need. Sure. So. I, I'm smiling because that's another one where my answer is going to be, well, it depends. Um, I mean, the, the key thing about consulting to remember is you are the product that they're selling, right? They're not selling widgets. They're selling you as an expert in something or, or as someone who is able to deliver something. So thinking about how you position yourself as a thing that is easy to sell is going to be really useful and important. That's on some of the sort of the big consulting firms, the Booz Allens, that kind of thing. For anybody who's a, who's a non-US citizen, they cannot sell you to the government, they can't. So a lot of those avenues, if you work for some of the big consulting firms in our space, those avenues are just closed because they can't sell you to anybody. So that may not be a great, the right, the right positioning for you. But for any of those kinds of firms thinking about this is the skill set. This is the knowledge that I bring. This is the language skills that I bring. This is the role of the Rolodex. They don't have Rolodex. This is the network of people that I bring with. Okay, see, Justine laughed. Um, you know, the, these are the, the things that I can contribute that you can turn around and pitch to somebody else. On the intergovernmental side, consultant means a really different thing. It means typically a short term, time limited contract to deliver a certain set of products. So when the World Bank says consultant, when the UN says consultant, that means if the thing lasts for six months at five months and 29 days, you may not have a job anymore and you need to be okay with that. And the, the IGOs are notorious for at five months and 29 days being like, well, will we or won't we, ah, sure, right? Or they say, no, get out, you don't know. So the consultant life in the IGO space can be very uneven but it can be a way to, to work for those organizations separate from the, the much more limited actual staff, salaried, long-term jobs that they might have. So again, for international students for whom DOD consulting is closed, bank consulting, IMF consulting, UN consulting might be a better space. But it's also important to remember that that is an enormous space. Everybody pitches to the bank, right? Everybody pitches to the fund because those are the organizations that they've heard of. The UN is like 40 different organizations with 47 different hiring processes. So only aiming for certain organizations that you know may not be the right fit. And this, since I'm not seeing any questions, maybe is a good time to talk a little bit about finding, like how to figure out stuff. Okay. So I talked to a lot of students who say, I wanna work on development or I wanna work on security. And that's lovely, but that's enormous. So development is not just one thing. Security is not just one thing. So the key factor is to push yourself a little bit and to say, well, what do I really mean when I say I want to work on development or I want to work on security? And maybe once you've sharpened those terms a little bit, you realize that what you really mean is I want to work on enterprise development. I want to, like, I think the private sector is a really good engine. I want to work on enterprise development. Well, okay, well, what do I really mean by enterprise development? what I really mean, and so you push yourself to that next level to clarify your terms. What I really mean is I wanna support women entrepreneurs to help grow their businesses in order to help them have less poverty in order to help their communities down the line. Okay, well, when I say women entrepreneurs, who do I mean? So you do this process with yourself and you push and you push and you push. Maybe what you realize is your real interest is in helping women entrepreneurs in rural Latin America access markets for the things they're already making. So now that you have this sense of what that problem is, what the issue that you have clarified for yourself under that big umbrella of development, then you can start to explore who's working in that space. And if you really are interested in women's enterprise development in rural Latin America, what you'll find is 
there's a private uh, that there's a private sector element to it. There's a public sector element to it, both national to those governments as well as a U.S. government element. There's a nonprofit element to it, and there's an intergovernmental element. So if you had said, "I want to work for a nonprofit," you may never have been able to un to see the opportunities in those other spaces, and to see how they all come together around that ecosystem, around that issue, which is still huge, but it is not as huge as all of development or all of security. So pushing yourself to really start to unpack, not who is it that I want to work for, but what kind of problem do I want to address can be a way of channeling your energy in a direction that lets you figure out, okay, this is the core of issues that I want to work on. Who's in that space? And also who is a barrier to success in that space? Because maybe the barriers to success for people who want to grow women-run enterprises in rural Latin America, maybe it's a corruption issue. Maybe it's an environmental issue. Maybe it's a national government issue. Maybe it's an access to capital issue and you want to help get them more capital to grow their businesses. But once you have an issue, a sense of the problem you want to try to solve or make stink a little bit less, and you have an, a, a sense of what the barriers are to success, you can start to do your research on who is chipping away at those barriers, who's lifting those people up, who's also trying to solve that problem in a way that if you just said, I, I want to work in the government or I want to work in the private sector, you may not come to see all that's possible and all the many jobs that might really be a fit for you in that space. Does that broadly make sense as a process? <laughs> Elisa says, oh yeah, no problem. I know I make it sound really easy, um, but it does, it takes that discernment and, and it does, it takes that kind of reflection and, and there's no right or wrong answer, but you can get a sense of what you, you really mean when you say those terms or when you say those words. And I get the sense that was not a, necessarily a direct response to me. <laughs> but also, you know, uh, well, Lisa, I know you had a really good question when you submitted on the RSVP form. Um, so I'd love to, yeah, go ahead for it. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Alyssa, by the way. It's oh, it lovely to hear you guys talk about all this stuff. I'm very grateful to hear all about this. Um, so my question is, what is the most memorable project that you've worked on? Ooh. So I was lucky. The first time I was an executive director, um, I was rebuilding an organization that worked on fair trade which most people have never heard of, but Alyssa, you're nodding, so I'm gonna take it, you've heard of it. Um, it's an approach to using trade as a tool for development, particularly among communities that are usually the most marginalized and the most left out of the trading system. And I was running the North American Association of Organizations that practice fully fair trade as a tool for, for reaching these communities. And one of the, the first things I had to do was help them with strategic planning, which I had never, which I had done a little bit, but not in a very formal way. And it was, I think the most impactful because it helped them see their strengths, see their weaknesses, clarify the problem they as, as 250 different organizations wanted to solve together. And also really importantly, it helped them figure out what they didn't want to do. And a lot of folks leave that part out. The part, the, the, the I'm okay letting someone else do that work part. Because there's always going to be more work to be done than you will have a human lifetime to deliver. So knowing what you want to work on and contribute to and knowing what it's okay to let somebody else do. Is, is probably the best work that I've done. And part of it, she says selfishly, is because they, they were in a really unstable place back then. And now they have like five staff and all these members and all this kind of stuff. So I like to take a, a little bit of pride in helping them lay that really solid foundation um, for that enabled them to be in this, in this much stronger place. But the lesson that I got from that was really about clarifying those terms and, and, and being able to, to, to just say no to stuff. Um, the other part you didn't ask, um, and I don't know, Samantha, do we have other questions in the chat or I'll, I'll just keep going? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, the other thing that I took from that was actually when I left there, 
So I went from working with these really, really small entrepreneurs who were one or two steps away from the communities that they were serving to go and work with the World Bank and the IMF and Bank of America, and these big, big financial institutions who had more money than God, right? And big clients and no short-term impact on the problems that they were working on. The time horizon was, you know, $20 billion in 15 years instead of like $20 in 15 minutes where I had come from. And it was really hard for me to shift my sense of success from working in a short, a small but immediate sense of impact to a much longer, much bigger sense of impact. And, and I, I say that because for, for a lot of you that either you've had that recompense or you, you might experience that where you just have to under, to be okay with small and immediate or patient for, for big and long-term. And I really, really struggled with that transition. And, and I couldn't understand why the work felt so different. And for me, I came to understand that I needed that more that shorter time horizon and that more immediate connection. I was three steps from the communities we were serving. I was good at my job, helped our members be better at their job and they were serving these communities. And I, I've come to see that I, I, you know, 15 steps was just too many for me. Um, so, so be smarter than I am is kind of the, <laughs> the advice that I have for all of you. Absolutely. So I'm actually going to ask a question from someone who they're, they're unable to mute. Um, but so, you know, international affairs, like you've mentioned, it spans, like it, it can, it has its own industry, but it can also span across, across other industries. Similar to how you were talking about how the NYPD has a whole um, sector of, you know, working on their international relations in, you know, across different fields. I'm just curious to what, um, what does international affairs look like in the sphere of higher ed? And I think you can also speak to that being part of APSIA as well. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of three, three big buckets um, for simplicity's sake. One is what's happening at institutions themselves. So it's gonna happen in the international student office for those who, who enjoy the mechanics of and the legal elements of bringing international students and scholars onto a campus welcoming them, helping them get acculturated. So there's the, that part of it. There's going to be within the institutions themselves, the admissions component, attracting international students from far and wide, helping the messaging make sense in different contexts um, and different languages, depending on the institution. So there's going to be the marketing public outreach admissions component to it. Um, also in higher ed might be the partnership and relationship component if you're setting up an exchange program, if you're running a study abroad program, all of that is about relationship management on behalf of the institution, as well as on the ground. If you have 30 students, you know, traipsing through Madrid, you need good relations or finding internships or whatever it is. So that's the institutional component. The other component is gonna be the nonprofit component in, higher, in international ed and higher ed. That's gonna be the folks who receive big grants from the State Department to run the Boren Fellowship, to run the Pickering Fellowship, to run the, the Afghan Scholar Rescue Program that's helping Afghan scholars leave Afghanistan and resettle in the states or resettle in other places. The Institute for Higher Education, uh, the Institute for International Education, American Councils for Education, IREX, there are all of these big, big nonprofits, mostly firms, who are doing this kind of work. There is a, a for-profit side to it too that's running some international ed programs, but the big, big beasts that get a lot of money from the government are gonna be those, those large institutions. And they're gonna want regional skills. They're gonna want grant management skills. They're gonna want those things that I talked about, about marshalling human resources. American Councils is a great example. They hire a lot of short-term folks to go to particular regions of the world or who are in particular regions of the world but it's not a, a HR job. It's, you know, I need 15 Korean speakers to lead groups of Americans around Korea for the summer of 2022, whatever that is. So it's about, you know, where can I find these people? What kinds of relationships do I have? It's, it's the program management side, the relationship development side, in addition to understanding how international higher ed works, in addition to sort of the, 
the, tra- the international affairs training that you had, there's these kind of um, broader program management kind of skills. And then the third big bucket, again, I'm painting with a large brush, um, and I'm thinking of others even as I say this, some of it's gonna be on the funder side, the State Department, the UN, do, you know, national governments to a, to a different extent, fund different programs and projects. So that also is gonna be about understanding how money moves, understanding how federal regulations work, as well as understanding a particular part of the world, what the dynamics are, what the culture is, what the language is. But the other piece is sort of these big inter- interconnected bodies. There's NAFSA, N-A-F-S-A, which is the Association of International Educators. And they're, again, gonna want relationship builders and network managers and project people and events people and comms people who also have that understanding of international education. So again, they have really different personalities and really they value, they prioritize, they all value all of those things, but they prioritize different things on their list of like gotta have versus nice to have. But those are some of the, the general buckets of, of ways that if you are called to international higher ed, you can sort of point. NAFSA has a great jobs board um, that also a lot of organizations post in. So that's one for folks who love the study abroad component, diversity abroad has a pretty good jobs board that uh, whether you want to do um, capacity building or be a study abroad av- advisor or some of those kind of things. Um, IIE is always hiring. IREX has been hiring like crazy. Um, the Chronicle for Higher Ed is another good jobs board that a lot of different institutions, it won't just be in international education, but it would be in higher ed writ large. All right, I see Alexander's question. What type of job would be best to place when to lead an institution one day? Um, who, Alexander, I say this as somebody who's been running nonprofit bits for 20 years. I mean, first of all, it's gonna depend on the kind of organization. If you want to be the president of the United States, it's really a different path than if you want to be the CEO, than if you want to be the ED of a company, and you will be UN Sec 10. I think some of it is about um, expertise in a particular issue, whether it is rural women's development in Latin America or cyber security. But a lot of it is going to be about leadership development. How do you bring out the best in other people? How do you trust, how do you build a sense of trust to, to turn stuff over to them? I know Samantha will deliver, so I don't have to stand over her shoulder and go, did you do it yet? How about now? Is it later? Some of it is going to be about the financial management component. You know, do you understand what the numbers are telling you? Do you understand when to spend money and when not to spend money? Some of that comes with experience. Some of that can be trained and learned, you know, especially if you're if you wanna work in a particular geographic location, learning the laws of that geographic location. In our space, you're never gonna learn all 194 countries laws on labor. So I would say knowing when to hire somebody to learn those things, that's, that's a useful trait. But, but you know, knowing when to save and when to spend is, is a really critical thing. Um, so in some ways, the, the best type of job, it's counterintuitive, but like office management, program management, see how the sausage gets made and then complement that with the, the area expertise um, because that's where the rubber meets the road. You can have the best idea, the most knowledge. If you can't put a budget together, you're screwed. If you can't hire people and train them and trust them to do work, you will never be able to do it yourself. So those really nuts and bolts, things that we think of as entry level, that's the best training ground in, in my opinion. Absolutely. And I mean, just to kind of go off that, yeah, like when I was first entering career services, you know, I started as an office assistant, but, you know, so I didn't, wasn't really doing career services that much, but I understood how, what it took to run the budget and, you know, having to make decisions and, you know, seeing how um, my supervisors made decisions on what went where, et cetera. And how are you spending, um, your, expending your time with your staff and all that, kind of, all, all that stuff. So who to call, who to call to get stuff done. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is a critical skill set that a lot of people do not have. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we are coming to the end of our hour and I will say, Robert, you're going to get the last question um, for of the day here. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, so what Robert's asking is, what would you say are emerging career areas for MIA students? So first of all, I want to put in just a quick cheap plug for some of the whoops, for some of the ways that you all can learn more and and tap into some of the tools that we're already doing. Um, 
And then Robert, I think, again, it's gonna depend on the issue area. I think there's two big fields. Um, one is that monitoring and evaluation piece that I talked about. What works about a situation? What doesn't? What do I grow? What do I fix? The other one is the communications piece. And I don't just mean communications professionals, but the ability to tell a compelling story that convinces a policymaker to go your way. The ability to, to convince a donor to invest in your project, to convince a company to pick up your product. There's so much noise right now, especially during COVID, but even before, if you are a compelling communicator that can cut through a lot of that, you, you can find a ton of opportunities. And again, these are things to be, to be practiced. In terms of issue areas, personally, I think water is gonna be a huge one. I think misinformation, which relates to communication, um, my acculturation, like helping people as they move from one place to another, feel welcome, feel part of a community, what you do about helping people feel connected to each other. Even in the US, you hear so much about disunity and, and how, and polarization. So people who can bring different communities together are gonna be as useful in, you know, whatever happens in Eastern Europe after some of the, the dust settles as they are gonna be in, you know, Topeka, Kansas, trying to bring different communities together. So it's, um, I would say community building, monitoring and evaluation, water, all, all of that kind of stuff, I, to me are the, some of the next horizons of, of where opportunities are gonna lie. Um, the key job and volunteer links I mentioned, sure. And, and I'll make sure Samantha has all of those tools too. Yes, absolutely. So we are coming to the end of the hour today. So everyone, please join me in thanking Carmen for all of her great expertise and sharing all um, the information with us. We will all be receiving a follow-up email today, again, with all the resources Car Carmen shared. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your Wednesday and week. Thanks, everybody.